and welcome to episode three of the of the Compass. Uh, today we're going to be talking about M and A, sort of fit with the news flow. Uh, I want to thank everyone for for watching uh, episodes one and two, and we've gotten some of your feedback. Um, noticed there was a question on political risk, specific political risk, and so we might uh, might take that on as its as its own topic in in a in a future episode. What we look for and, and things like that, but. Um, the news of the week has been uh, the news of the week has been M and A. We've got uh, two sort of significant transactions at, at the beginning of the week. Uh, we're recording this on Friday, August second. So, um, you know, I think it's worth uh, worth talking about those transactions. Obviously, we've got Philo, Philo with this four billion dollar takeout being taken out by BHP and Lundy, um, and Integra's acquisition of Florida Canyon. So, um, two very very different transactions with different impacts. We talk about M and A cycle in the cycle. Um, you know. Before you get into who's going to get bought, I think you have to understand, you know, where the buyers are coming from. And this is something we we picked up on um, last year at the Denver Gold Forum, sitting in on presentations, which we like to do for the, the majors and mid tiers um, at those shows. And, and Sam, you know, we sort of identified at that show, we identified three or four companies that should buy something or, or have the ability to buy something, um, probably both. Um, maybe you want to talk about that? Yeah, so, so those I've, names? Let's say that there's three companies beyond the usual potential buyers like Agnico, Kinross, we know it's an acquisitive uh, company. Um, but in particular, there, is, there are three companies that we think are, are, are ripe, and I'm not surprised they haven't done anything yet, well, with the exception of, I guess, number one, Dundee Precious Metals. Uh, their operations in Bulgaria are going full steam, great cost uh, profile. They have um, created themselves this huge uh, cash pool. Uh, pushing 700 million right now. That's in spite of them paying a nice dividend, uh, buying back stock. Um, great, great company uh, all around, but they need growth. Um, they tried they tried Osino. Um, they got beat uh, by a superior offer from a, from a Chinese group. Uh, I'd be surprised if they don't take a, a run at something else uh, in the near future. Uh, some of the companies that we're going to mention later on as targets, uh, I think they, they were all fit on uh, their profile. The, the second one is Centera. Um, you know, following the uh, the issues they had in Kumtor, et cetera, et cetera, the Centera of the 2020 decade uh, today has effectively Mount Milligan, the Mali business, and around $700 million in cash. Uh, so again, another company that should do something. Um, they brought in um, um, former corporate development type uh, profile, a CEO last year. Uh, obviously, I in my read, the intention would be to... Uh, to acquire somebody. And the third one, and it actually ties in with uh, with the London Group, uh, as we're gonna talk about Philo today, but uh, London Gold. Um, with the a cash generation of the last couple of years, they've cleaned up the balance sheet. They had some they had some uh, other parts of the cap structure that have all been cleaned up. And now they're in the tremendous cash generation phase. Uh, the fruit of the north that continues to surprise. Uh, great profile is fantastic. Uh, tonnage has also been uh, pretty good, and that has translated in a tremendous ability to generate cash. Um, they've been rumored to be on the look for things, but again, for them in, in their particular situation, um, they have the ability to use their paper as well. Uh, it's a nicely valued company, I think something around $5 billion market cap, uh, although it's a $500,000 producer with nice margins. So those three are companies that we think um, are going to be active. Um, in the in the in the very near term future. Well, and, and the other company that we identified at uh, at Denver last year was uh, was Calibre, which uh, then has has subsequently gone out and uh, acquired um, Valentine, uh, the Valentine project uh, via Marathon. So, um, you know, look for those other three. Would expect those other three companies to uh, um, proceed. But I guess you know maybe the transactions of the week um, go back there first and foremost. Um, you know, feel of being taken out with BHP lending with a you know for four and a half billion, which is a combination of cash and stock. Um, maybe Sam, give us a quick rundown of the transaction, but more importantly, um, let's talk about why cash matters. Well, cash matters because um, it's going to be recycled effectively. And what I mean by that is there is a, a a number of, for example, ETFs that hold Philo stock. Uh, on the on the on closing of the transaction, they're going to receive cash or shares of. Uh, of one of the buyers, and they will proceed to sell that. And immediately, they're going to reallocate those dollars to other companies, uh, presumably companies that are already in that ETF or some that may be added. But I guess the important thing is the exercise where those 
call it two to two and a half billion. Um, the cash component is capped at two point eight, but Canadian. Um, it all, it's going to be recycled into our space, junior resource space. So there is going to be an influx of capital available uh, to fund new projects, to improve the valuation. Some of some of the companies, some some of the companies are going to get higher weightings in the ETFs as a result of Fiedel leaving those indices. Um, so it's going to create a second, third, fourth order effects down the road that I see all of them as positive. And that's the importance of having this, uh, you know, takeouts, but more importantly, when there's a cash component, it makes it easier um, to recycle the cash. Uh, now, Sam, you were in a, you were, you're an active manager ran a traditional mutual fund um, back in the day. How does that, I mean, you talk about the ETFs recycling, how does that cash component for, for you as a, as a, for the active managers out there? Cause there are still a number of, uh, resource funds that are active managers that would have owned uh, own feel right to the end. Um, and to be honest, uh, in this situation where it's extremely unlikely that there'll be a superior offer, considering that BHP and Lundin already own north of something like 40% of the uh, underlying stock in Philo, uh, you would sell right away. There's arbitrage funds that come in and short the, the, the acquirer and, and, and go long Philo to close the gap. So what we would do back in the day, and I assume, uh, what I would do in this situation if, if I was in that position is uh, I would sell right away and start deploying elsewhere uh, immediately. So we, 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 we don't have to wait for a transaction to close to start seeing the benefits of that spillover recycling of the capital. Now, if we look at, you think about that, I mean, we didn't talk, you know, um, valuation wise, obviously this is an interesting transaction because it's because of the scale of Philo, it seems uh, pretty toppy from a, from a valuation perspective. You, you ran the numbers there. Yeah, but I guess b before I go into those specific numbers, um, I, I, I can't understate, I, I don't want to understate how big a deal this transaction is for our universe. Uh, the last transaction with cash from a major of a sizable valuation, in my mind, was Great Bear 2021. That's two and a half years ago. Uh, the Discovery Group did a great job uh, monetizing that, growing that asset and monetizing uh, at, at the right time. Um, but if you go back, I, I can't just think of an asset of this stage where Fino del Sol is selling for a valuation like this. Uh, maybe you have to go all the way back to Voices Bay. I don't know. Uh, it's probably worth the exercise going back and seeing. But I just wanted to highlight how rare it is to have this you know, $4 billion type of uh, transactions for an asset that's not in production and is not under construction yet. So I, I, again, I, don't, I, I just can't state how important this is for our industry. Um, in terms of valuation, uh, so it's, you know, call it just over 4 billion uh, Canadian. If you run that out, it's 3 billion US, give or take, um, for about 6 billion pounds of copper equivalent. Um, and by, by no measure, that's going to be the final resource. That's the resource that they have out there right now, but that's the one we have to go by. So that turns to be around 50 cents uh, a pound of copper in the ground. When you add the 50-50 joint venture that they're going to do with Jose Maria, that's another billion pounds, give or take. So it goes down to 40-ish uh, cents uh, per pound. That's under, that's about 10% of where the price of copper is right now. So that would be the equivalent of paying, you know, if gold is 2400 2500 that's a $240 an ounce on the ground, which is certainly on the top end of, what you know, what we've been used to in terms of transaction comparables. I'd say though that though you know, this immediately becomes obviously Lundin's biggest project, and it becomes the new shiny toy for BHP. Um, so I suspect they're going to throw a lot of energy, capital, and human resources at it. And six billion pounds is not the last thing we're going to see as a resource. And not to fall into the cliche, but this is the generational asset type thing. This is the the graduation of London mining from perhaps a tier two to a tier one global mining company. So sometimes sometimes you do pay up for those things. And um, it's also the consolidation of the Bikunia district, um, which you know they pretty much have corralled completely. So um, again, this is a fantastic, fantastic deal uh, for our industry. Um, I can stay that more. Yeah, I, I I think that that's uh the the generation the, the expense the 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 price being paid and the generational asset aspect of it I think is you know it sounds it sounds cliche and 
you watch these base metal companies build 30 year assets with single digit IRRs or, or, or low, double, very low, exceptionally low double digit IRRs, like 10, 10, 15%. But when you're talking about a 30 year mine life or 40 year mine life or a 50 year mine life, um, you, and, and I suspect that's what we're looking at in the Cunha district. It, you not only do you, you pay for it in one cycle, you pay for the infrastructure in one cycle and you make money in every cycle after that. And that's what a lot of the major copper assets in the world are. Um, if you look across the top 10, um, maybe the one, the, the exceptions being the, the ones that were built in, the, in very recently. So Otogoy, um, Kavoa Kukula and, uh, um, uh, Cobra Panama, which has its own problems. Um, but I guess, uh, looking out, you know, obviously BHP was in the news recently cause they took a run at Anglo, which is a $40 billion transaction, uh, Anglo American, which is a 40, you know, which would have been a $40 billion transaction. Um, I guess, does this take BHP out of so maybe doing something with Anglo or something with a, a similar size uh, base metal company as they look to consolidate the space, or is this uh, or are these two very different things? So I I, I don't think so. Um, so if you go back, um, so BHP acquired Awesome Minerals. Everything feels like it was last year. Maybe it was two years ago. Um, you know, it's the largest mining company in the world. They can certainly go ahead and do other big type, big ticket type acquisitions. I'd say now that it's less likely that they'll be aggressive. They now have, you know, a, a, a copper growth asset. So what I would say is, what does it mean for everybody else, right? So Anglo American still exists. Um, I suspect um, there's going to be changes at the helm there. Um, that doesn't seem to be working out for them. Uh, their diversification into agricultural commodities isn't going well. They've scaled back their growth plans there. Um, and they have problems with uh, the diamond business, uh, you know, literally of problems. Um, there's Glencore, who is digesting the acquisition of the coal assets from tech. But remember, the original bid was for all of tech. They also wanted the copper. So I think tech is in play as a, as a, as a major. Uh, don't forget about Vale Base Metals. That's a company that, although Vale is out of Brazil, uh, it has a quite sizable presence in Canada. Uh, I wouldn't rule out them being acquired or being an acquirer of. They've recently announced uh, Sean Usmar as CEO. He comes of Triple Flag, so a deal-oriented type company. Um, so I guess they're going to be deal-oriented in this capacity as well. Um, and well, I think just before just before you move on from that one, I think that's that the uh, the Valley base models and, and tech is the. I guess on the uh, on the on the, on the tw in the Twitter sphere and other and other uh, you know locations where, where investors sort of uh, get to post and on post anonymously. Certainly something that's been talked about and considered. And I think you know actually um, oddly enough uh, sounds like it makes sense. Um, yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean it'll happen, but uh, no, I think that's a that, that's a good point. There are a lot of um, those bigger scale companies out there. Um, it, Hud Bay would be another. Uh, would be another example of a sort of a, 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 a mid-scale copper producer that could have target us back, but also could just as easily be an acquirer of things yes, right. um, as, as before. What about, um, just thinking about this, you know, taking it a step further, what about, you know, talk about the big guys. Um, what about development stage assets? Because all those companies you mentioned are, are legit going concerns. Um, you know, they also need growth uh, just like BHP does. Uh, they might not have the, uh, a hundred plus people sitting in office here in Toronto just focused on that, but they're uh, like BHP does, but uh, they do have, uh, they are, they are out there looking for stuff. So um, I guess what about those other copper development copper assets? I, I think part of the appeal of the Vicuña district and the reason why this transaction, I think went through at this valuation is because there is an absence of tier one type copper assets out there. Um, there are projects within the operating companies. You know, Tech has its QB2 expansion project, but there aren't any, I'm, let me restate that because there are. There aren't companies, many companies like Philo or with the potential of generational tier one, et cetera. Um, there is uh, Solaris comes to mind in Ecuador, Sol Gold in Ecuador. Solaris received an offer recently uh, from, uh, from a Chinese group, uh, we all remember the famous Warren Irwin uh, X slash tweet saying that it was not going to be approved and uh, it all indicates that he was correct. Um, so the, the, there are assets out there, but there, are, there aren't as many 
as as you would think, and and certainly not the ones that fit the profile of a tech. Um, perhaps the most appealing could be first quantum, either as a whole or asset by asset. Uh, I don't know, um, but I don't see a, a tremendous number of copper developers that fit that scale profile. Just before I pass it over to you, there is there is the golden triangle. Um, we have a probably a good ten or twelve companies there with kind of option to become sizable, but I don't think any of them have graduated to that scale yet. But a lot of that, that's a good point. But a lot of those assets that are out there, copper assets that are in developers or juniors are tier two or tier three, right? Correct. That's what made Philo unique. It's, so there's a lot of what I would describe as sort of 0.2.2 large scale copper deposits, right? Which are um, big capex, um, you know, uh, big. Uh, tend to be tight margins, especially, I mean, maybe a $5 copper, $2,500 gold, a 0.2.2 copper porphyry, copper gold porphyry uh, works, but, um, you know, they, they are, they tend to be marginal and tend to come with exceptionally high cash costs. So I think that's where, I think that's the, the I think, uh, I think we've uh, beat copper to death um, with, the, with that, with that discussion. We'll, and we'll talk about a couple of our names. One of them has a bit of a copper kick to it uh, later, but I think, you know, going on to the next transaction, from this week, which was uh, Integra Florida Canyon, which was interesting. Um, you know, obviously you've got Integra, a development company, recently completed a, a, a prior consolidation uh, merged with another a sort of Southwest US uh, development stage company, created a pipeline of assets, um, creating a pipeline of assets for them. Um, now they've gone to, I guess, the next step and bought a producer. Now, you know, it, you know, by all accounts, Florida Canyon doesn't have a long mine life ahead of it. Um, it tends, it is a short life, but you know, $2,500 gold where, where we're sitting today probably has a shot at, uh, um, uh, probably has a shot at, uh, um, uh, yeah, you know, some real cash cash flow. Flow. yeah, right. Exactly. And I think what the, you know, if you look at the transaction and I mean, the valuation is $95 million. It's not, you know, for 70,000 ounces a year, five year mine, like maybe, um, that makes sense. But I think where, where it makes a lot of sense for, from an Integra shareholder's point of view, um, is that, you know, you're buying that cash flow that you need in the interim as you're developing these projects. It, it, in principle, short of this $20 million raise, which looks like it might be underwater short of that, you've got a, you've got the opportunity to not take, you know, some of those dilution engineering studies and, and things that, and permitting work that, that Integra is undertaking doesn't necessarily need, uh, to come back to market for. And, you know, maybe those ounces, again, the other thing is, is that those ounces, uh, those producing ounces, they might be a little worth a little more with a company, with a company like Integra that has a, that has a, a really good market presence and is good at generating market awareness. And, um, I, so I, I, I think it's, I, I understand the logic. I think, I think yeah, go ahead, Sam. it also gives them the appeal to buy more things, right? Buying a producing asset as a developer, it's a fantastic deal. Um, I don't know Florida Canyon very well, but you know you're you just leveraging your market awareness and the you know good relationship with the street. You parlay that into being becoming a producer via acquisitions. Uh, that's fantastic because it opens the door for them to do more of those types of deals while they're keep advancing their development assets. I wouldn't be surprised if they try to buy somebody else in six or twelve months' time when they've kind of digested and and settled with with this asset and. It reminds me a little bit of previous success stories, like uh, like like Endeavor, for example. Endeavor started off small, and they just kept parlaying that production into bigger acquisitions, and it's now one of the better mid tiers, uh, you know, from a cash flow perspective, uh, you know, cash generation perspective, and and just overall value creation over the last uh, eight or ten years. I, I don't know how long it's been. So I, I think kudos to them. I'm I'm I'm, I'm impressed. And uh, I, I wish them well. I think they can turn this into something, um, you know, from, like you're saying, from a company that was facing a serious dilution over a number of years as they put those things into production. Now they turn it upside down and they're a cash flow generating company. So I, in principle, I like that idea quite a bit. Yeah. I, 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 you know, one thing is though, is that, and this is the interesting part about that transaction is that m and breeds m and Yeah. Right. So we, we, we didn't talk about like, you know, we, we talked about two deals that happened this week, but there's been a steady flow of M&A deals over the last year, transa steady flow of transactions. And so, you know, this Florida Canyon hasn't even been listed that long, right? But it was the spin out of um, Argonaut Gold, 
which was acquired by Alamos for Mangino, uh, which obviously has ob obvious synergies with, uh, I forget the name of the asset now off the top of my head, but has obvious synergies with for them uh, in Northern Ontario. And so that Island Gold uh, has obvious synergies with Island Gold for them. And so this was a spin out, right? And so this they, there was the Mexican assets that were producing and Florida Canada. Obviously, these, these assets are all basically too small for uh, Alamos. And so they subsequently, you know, Put, it, put them out on the market. The Mexican assets have sold, and now uh, now Florida Cady is sold. And it, and you know we're seeing that, and you see that elsewhere too. So it, it's a it's an interesting point um, if you look at other uh, M and A transactions. But I think the other thing is that um, I think the other thing that's really interesting about this is that it's consult it's all in the Southwest U.S., which I think is an area um, from my yeah. uh, my experience being CEO of Gold Star is an area that needs a lot of consolidation. And there are a lot of, you know, if you get really good at operating 0.3 gram a ton open pit heat leaches, uh, if you can really make Florida Canyon work, you've got a lot of potential targets that you can roll up and and, and deploy that expertise because there's there are a substantial number of them uh, uh, around, um, you know, that that could be started for pretty low capex. Looking at this transaction, this isn't the type of target that we go out and look for um, for obvious reasons. It's small scale, um, you know. We've seen some transactions in this area, but there are a lot fewer buyers. You know, there's Mako and Gold Source um, that was done very similar thing. Mako's a small producer, cash flow. They bought a, a developer that's a, a smaller scale development asset. You know, that makes sense for them. But you're not. It's very hard to chase these small scale assets because there's a, the pool of buyers is a is a lot is a lot smaller. But I, I wouldn't be surprised, as you said, Sam. I wouldn't be surprised to see this spur um, other M and A, and maybe it spurs other M and A in the sense of. Um, Integra goes out and buys some other things. Maybe they look at their asset base and go, okay, we have some, you know, we've got three or four assets in the pipeline. We've got some fifth and sixth tier assets that we probably can potentially divest. Nice. Um, I guess uh, looking at the time and where we are, we probably should talk about some names that we own primarily for M&A. Now, what I would say is that uh, this is going to be controversial because we're going to talk about some things that, that we think are going to get taken out. Um, but also I want to, you know, point out that you often, it's very rare that we will buy something and, and that investors should, you know, this is an investment advice, but you should buy something purely for the takeout possibility, um, unless you have high certainty that that's going to happen. A, a lot of M&A is um, very rare, requires willing sellers on both sides. Um, it's very difficult to consummate a deal, even though it makes perfect sense. Um, one of our, one of our, uh, um, one of our, our names we're going to talk about is going to fit perfectly with that. So, um, first name we own, and it definitely has an, uh, we think has a, a real possibility to be taken out is, uh, is Troilus. And now, you know, why Troilus? Well, we're invested in Troilus because it's in a tier one jurisdiction. It has scale, 11 million ounces, 200, 200,000 plus ounces a year, life of mine, peaks out at 500,000 ounces. Yes, it has high capex. Yes, the IRR is low, but it's a generally a low, a low grade deposit. So, you know, maybe not a, uh, probably a tier two or tier three, but the jurisdiction um, and the fact that you're going to get some of that um, construction capital from the from the uh, from the government related entities in, uh, Quebec. in Quebec makes a huge huge difference, and I think that makes it attractive to um, potential uh, and it, acquirers. There, there, there's other things uh, to trade us. One is um, there's infrastructure on site. This is a disturbed site. It was in production for 15 years or so. Produced cumulative analysis. There is a there is a power line to site or roads, et cetera, et cetera. So it, the project has been de-risked uh, from an operational perspective. Um, there is also um, let's not call it willingness to sell because I don't think that's what it is. But there is a, a, a corporate structure that is not decidedly set up for uh, construction. Um, so I, we think there is a, uh, an element of uh, uh, would favor uh, um, voting in favor of a, of a reasonable price transaction uh, if it were to be offered. Um, in, a, in, in addition to that, like Derek said, it's 11 million ounces. Uh, I will, I want people to comment how many mil 10 million plus ounces uh, deposits are in, are in Canada and available for purchase. Um, the biggest knock that I've heard on Troilos is great, um, but it just kind of Reminds me of the conversations we were having two weeks ago about margin expansion when uh, gold prices go up. Um, these assets do have that benefit. 
of what what we call operational leverage, right? The more the more the gold price goes up, the more margin this type of operations uh, have as an expansion. And perhaps the best known of these types of deposit would be D2 Lake. I'm not saying they're one for one because they there aren't, but if you if you remember D2 Gold, they struggled quite a bit to build that line because they were a developer and they were building in a difficult market. Once that asset found, it, found its way to Agnico, it's now producing 700,000 ounces a year at something like $1,000 only sustaining. I don't have it in front of me, but it's a pretty good house basis. And the exploration upside has resulted in 20 plus million ounces of resource um, ahead. So I think that's why Troilus could be appealing for certain companies. What you see today on the feasibility study of uh, 14 to 19 percent IRR, yes, that's what the engineer the engineer said at 2000 at 1975 gold, I think it was. Um, but it, it omits kind of like the improvements that somebody with a real balance sheet can give this asset over the years, over the exploration upside, and perhaps some high grade satellite pots that they can find over the years. So I think this has the 30 year mine life potential, 300,000 pounds a year type uh, type thing. And it does have a copper kicker, uh, which is something that we see more and more uh, gold companies talking about. Um, so that's why we think this is a genuine uh, takeover uh, target for not, not just for the majors. I think, I think the three companies that we mentioned at the beginning could also be in the, in the play for something like this. It's a situation where those types of companies could use their paper to buy it and their cash to build it, right? Um, and as they, uh, you know, as they progress towards permitting, um, I think it, it gets to getting their permits and, and in Quebec, it's not a, I wouldn't describe it as a, 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 certainties are terrible in this business, but I'd say it's a high probability, um, especially in that, in that part of the world or that part of Quebec. Um, the other, the second name we want to talk about, um, and I think it's, it, it's kind of obvious to talk about it on a, on a show where we're talking about an episode where we're talking about M&A, but is um, the position that we hold, uh, which is Orion. And, and, and oddly enough, um, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion around the M&A around that. But I think the yeah. the interesting part there is is what you're kind of, you know, right now, what you're kind of partially investing in is, is a proxy on Rupert. So, you know, we've talked about Rupert. We talked about you know what we look for in a developer, and 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 Rupert ticks a lot of those boxes. It's expensive, and it's expensive for a reason. You know, four million ish ounces at at two grams a ton gold in a in a good jurisdiction. Um, that's what you know what that's what majors and mid tiers are looking for. Unfortunately, they don't own the layback that they need um, onto the JV ground, uh, materially altering project economics for them, and so they're trying to get that accomplished. And this is where I think. Um, Orion comes in. They hold enough keys on the joint venture, which is a joint venture between themselves and B2. Um, and I think that, you know, something's going to happen. Um, interestingly enough, um, we know that nothing, you know, uh, it, it, knowing a little bit about, you know, what you have to disclose when you complete a financing, uh, which both companies are doing right now, um, there's probably no, there's no active discussions at this moment. Um, but that's, uh, once they're both cashed up and have some runway, I suspect that we're going to see um, to see that, and, that and, move ahead. Yeah, and, and with Orion in particular, I think the, one of the reasons why we're involved is we, we see an opportunity to participate in M&A or to make money on this investment two or three times. So if you were to think about it, if there's a deal with Rupert that consolidates the ground, presumably we've done a premium, so that then you get your first monetization event, then I think at that point somebody takes a run on Rupert because in my mind, that's the only thing holding it back is consolidating the ground that they need to, to build a real project. And potentially, we've seen this done before, is there could, there could potentially be a spin-out a spin of, of the exploration assets held in Orion outside of the JV ground, which would be your third type of uh, potential monetization down the road, much like uh, you know, the Alan was did with Magino and uh, when the Magino transaction is spinning out of Florida Canyon. Um, so... I think Rupert is a is a almost no brainer, uh, but the way we're playing it is is through Orion, um, just because we see this further potential uh, from a return perspective. Uh, you know, Rupert trades at hundred and eighty dollars an ounce, give or take. That's on the higher end of the comparables for transactions. 
So if there was going to be a takeout, you know, you could make maybe get a 20% premium, 30% premium. But with Orion, we think we can, you know, play that game and uh, and, and get that, that premium paid twice or three times. So, yeah, and I think that I think the interesting part for us is on that one in particular is that you know why do you think there's a likelihood of uh, someone else coming over the top? Well, you've got on in both companies you have majors and you have two different majors. Um, you know, uh, Kinross is a nine point nine percent shareholder of of Orion. They've just re-upped um, in this uh, financing. Um, similarly, um, you know, uh, I, Rupert has uh, has a Nico Eagle. So obviously. Their majors in the room already. They know what they're looking for, and Agico obviously operates in that in that camp uh, already uh, with uh, Kittle just up the road. The last name to discuss, which is maybe a little more uh, controversial, and is certainly not. We're not recommending this as something to buy. It's just interesting to talk about. Um, let's just is, let, let's caveat that with saying if we had recorded this two months ago, yeah, we would have probably been our number one pick. Uh, but right. that's how it goes. And, yeah, um, which is Victoria Gold. Um, Victoria, you know, a couple hundred thousand ounces a year, um, both operationally and balance sheet lever at the time. Let's, let's Victoria two months ago. It's certainly one that would benefit from someone with a balance sheet to to come in and and and, and, and protect it or help it. Um, now, and we so just for disclosure, we own Victoria. We don't own it anymore. Um, and, and part of that reason is that what we see is that assuming that there is a path at some point, if, if we get the government provides a path back to production for Victoria, which I think is um, it's a possibility, you know, but not a certainty by any measure. Know, it's yeah. it's a possibility. Yeah, yeah, it's a possibility. Um, I, I think that if you get that path back to production, you are going to need a significant capital injection into Victoria. Um, what that number is will depend on what the path looks like. Um, you know, Victoria has a has a challenge balance sheet, and so it actually might make sense for it to be taken out but i you know you wouldn't i would rather because the pot because of the, the probability that there is no path back to production and because their balance sheet is such that they could go bankrupt if there is no path back to production really hesitant to think about that until there is a path yeah. um well but there could it, be a take it, it does fit. with no money for equity holders right because you have right. to pay yeah. the debt you have to inject money into the company uh there's going to be some assurances that the government is going to want presumably so you know, a major could come in, take out the project, and there'll be nothing left for the equity holder. That's that's our fear, uh, even if there's a path forward uh, at the asset level. Um, but I think there's still a, a reasonable, a possible chance that that, that somebody comes up. Um, there are there are companies that have experience and expertise uh, working in these conditions. Um, Keen Ross comes to mind. Um, there are lots of experience. Um, I, I cover I cover Victoria when it was a developer, um, and they Victoria I think Kinross was a shareholder of Victoria at the time, and Kinross uh, certainly helped them on the um, the northern heat bleach work and testing and and kind of gave them access to show them the way on how to do it. So there's um, there's certainly uh, um, An understanding of the asset and the, are, yeah. yeah. I guess the reason we're mentioning it is because we think there is still a chance that there is an acquisition of that asset. Um, we just don't think there is a it's worthwhile for us to invest in the in the equity, um, which is also kind of part of the conversation. Not every acquisition makes money, uh, right? For for shareholders, something I'd like to see from from the audience in terms of feedback is is this list or these names that we've mentioned they are by no means exhausted. Um, so we'd love to hear what people think in terms of. Who's getting taken out next, or or where 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 do you see the opportunity? We've received inbounds from some people, and um, we have a pretty good idea of some of the ideas that people have in terms of what may happen in Ontario, um, particularly around Wawa. But you know, please do let us know. Um, we may we may take some of those ideas and discuss them in a future episode, or um, maybe you know. Year end, we go through a checklist and see how our picks did and how your picks uh, uh, did, and uh, be an interesting exercise to get some feedback um, from that from that perspective. Also, who do you think is most likely to buy something uh, uh, out of the three names that we picked, or do you think there's a there's another one that's even more likely? Uh, please do let us know, and maybe I'll throw out just the last one. A lot of people are saying that I am gold is right for takeout, and 
in my contrarian view of the world, if everything goes well, they're going to start making so much money so quickly. But what's the allure of selling when they can turn around and become buyers? Um, that's also a controversial opinion. But uh, let's see what happens. We'll revisit well, this conversation. Yeah, yeah. That that's one where either it works and it's it would it's it doesn't get taken out because it's valuation has a lot to move to go up, or it doesn't, or they are challenged. They have a challenging startup, and it does, um, which is an interesting uh, thought to look at. Right? Is that you know it gets taken out when it when they when some of these companies run into problems um, on, on startup, they get the valuation gets depressed and they get taken out. And that back to your point, not all takeouts make money, right? You might have. You might be thinking, okay, I'm going to buy in gold because it's going to get taken out. Then they have a challenging startup, share price comes down, and then you're, yeah, it still gets taken out, but you're below where you actually, yeah, your thesis held true, but you didn't make money. And unfortunately, uh, we're in a business where you're supposed to make money, not uh, not uh, uh, being right. It's more important to make money than to be right. So um, I think with that, I agree with uh, we look forward we, we look forward to your feedback on, on this episode and yeah, toss us your names and maybe we'll do... Uh, Maybe we'll do uh, in a month or so. We'll do a uh, an episode where we talk about uh, uh, names from the audience on on M and A and give our thoughts. Thank you.